Well, why should Christians get involved in politics? What is a biblical worldview for thinking about politics and being involved in it? How should faith intersect with political office or with expressing political views? What attitude should Christians take to the state or to public policy? Is it Christian to be on the left or is it Christian to be on the right? There are huge shifts and realignments going on in political landscapes all around the world these days. And these changes are affecting everyone, not least of all Christians. How should Christians react? How should we position ourselves in the midst of all these changes? So I'm speaking here today as a Christian to Christians. If you're not a Christian and you're here today, you're very welcome. <laughs> I love to have you present, listening in to somebody else's conversation but I'm not speaking directly to you today. This is about equipping Christians to think biblically and to live out and apply the truth. For a long time in Western nations, some Christians have taken the view that the mainstream of our culture is Christian, or at least biblically based in some sense, and Christians have spoken, as it were, from a majority position. This is increasingly no longer the case, and at the very least, it's highly contested. So how do we believers do politics from what might be considered a minority position or at least a waning position of social influence? For me, the most important passage in the whole Bible about this is found in Jeremiah 29, where the exiles in Babylon are told to seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. The Bible commands the Jewish believers in exile to take the welfare of their society to heart. It matters not that our society might be thoroughly pagan, as Babylon was. It, does, it doesn't matter that our rulers might worship other gods, or even that our whole system is designed to serve other gods. What I mean is... Of course, these things do matter, but it doesn't make a difference to the call on our lives as believers. The call to us as believers remains the same, to actively seek the well-being, the flourishing of our society. Seek, the prophet Jeremiah says, it's such a powerful word. It implies intention, deliberation, thoughtfulness and care. Now, sometimes Christians get confused because Jesus made clear that his kingdom is not of this world. He's even said, my kingdom is not of this world. <laughs> Some Christians have adopted a social separatism in response to this. If our role is to seek first the kingdom of God, as in Matthew 6.33, then what have we to do with politics? Or so the argument goes. And there have been some groups, like the Anabaptists, who, in response to persecution, uh, disconnected politically. They've gone down the path of avoiding anything to do with politics in some versions. But that's not actually what Jesus taught. He didn't tell us not to seek the well-being of the city. He just said, seek the kingdom first. In other ways, also, he respected and upheld the role of government, for example, instructing people to pay their taxes to Caesar. The apostles, too, had a positive view of how Christians should view the state. Paul tells us to be subject to the governing authorities. And to do this, he says, out of fear of the Lord, out of religious conviction. Because, he said, it's God who establishes political authority for the good of all of us. And likewise, Peter says, show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers Fear God, honor the emperor. He's speaking at a time when Christians were being bitterly persecuted by the emperor, by the authorities. These Jewish followers of Jesus, Paul and Peter, were deeply formed in the values of a people of God in exile, the values of Jeremiah 29. But let's go back to Jeremiah. His call to the Jews in exile, living in captivity under alien gods, to seek the well-being of Babylon, it has a context. The context was the prophet's earlier calls back in Israel, before the exile, to seek what was good in their own land. 
Jeremiah 5.1, go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, look around and consider, search through her squares. If you can find but one person who deals honestly and seeks the truth, I will forgive this city. Jeremiah is told by God to earnestly search high and low for even just one person who cares about the truth. Even for one person, God would have forgiven the city. But there was such a famine of the word of God, such a famine of truth in the land that the whole nation was destroyed and sent into exile. And then again in Jeremiah 5.28, God condemns the rich and powerful. For what? For not seeking justice. Like cages full of birds, he writes. Their houses are full of deceit. They have become rich and powerful. They have grown fat and sleek. Their evil deeds have no limit. They do not seek justice. They do not promote the cause of the fatherless. They do not defend to the just cause of the poor. Seek truth. Seek justice. This is the whole context for the advice given by Jeremiah to the Jews in Babylon to understand what it means to seek the well-being of the city. To seek the city's well-being, they are not to abandon that earlier call to truth and justice, but to develop it, to promote it, to apply it, to seek this in their new city, even serving under their alien gods. A great example, of course, of someone who lived out these principles was Daniel, who faithfully served a pagan ruler following a pagan cult, but was also faithful to God's truth in his worship and devotion. He knew where to draw the line, and he did not abandon the society or the city in which he was living as he worshipped God. He loyally served the Babylonian and then the Persian states while remaining true to the holy God of Israel. Undoubtedly, one of the great challenges facing Christians in the West is the degree to which we can be diverted and taken over by the culture around us. Paul's call in Romans 13 for Christians to be subject to the governing authorities, this follows hard on his invitation in Romans 12 to offer our bodies as living sacrifices and not to be conformed to the pattern of this world. Or as the J.B. Phillips translation put it, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And the fact is, we do get squeezed. One of the ways we get squeezed is by being shamed. How could you say that? How dare you say that? You keep your beliefs to yourselves. Just shut up, you shameful person. And this is one of the great challenges facing Christian families and individuals and communities today to cultivate and nurture a biblical worldview, a truth-based take on the world. It's a challenge for our young people being exposed to the latest trends in education. It's a challenge for older people. It's a challenge for us to raise children who are formed in the truth and have the boldness, boldness and moral clarity to defend it, unashamed. It's a challenge for us ourselves to be that kind of person. Sometimes the squeezing can come from unexpected directions. We need to be alert. We need to be encouraged by people who show us how to do this. About a year ago, I was speaking up and writing during the marriage campaign, uh, speaking up for marriage as being a union of a man and a woman. It's a biblical perspective. The Bible is, to use uh, contemporary language, is thoroughly heteronormative, as they put it. But for me, it was and is a truth issue. And there, is a, there was a risk for Christians at that time to be seen to be just upholding the past. Some said they were defending traditional marriage, and I think they meant well. The idea was that we shouldn't let go of what is good in the past, but I don't believe that was the best way to put the Christian position. I don't so much believe in traditional marriage as in biblical marriage. What is the difference? Well, there are a number of differences that are important to many people. Not all aspects of traditional marriage, or at least the way it's been lived out, have been good. The idea that women couldn't take out a mortgage or own property in their own name 
has not been a good aspect of what people might consider traditional marriage. It was only in 1870 that the English Parliament passed an act allowing married women to be the legal, legal owners of the money they earned or to inherit property. And there's also been a traditional kind of um, implicit acceptance of domestic violence within marriage in our culture, not amongst all people, but it's been an issue. It's not so much traditional marriage that Christians should be defending, but a biblical understanding of marriage, biblical marriage. And I call this an example of being squeezed because when we should be defending one thing, a biblical truth-based understanding of marriage, we end up defending something else which is subtly different, which is a kind of social conservatism or a cultural value. And yes, the cultural values can be good and they can be shaped by the Bible, but we need to be careful what we're standing on, what's the foundation for our feet. Of course, there's pressure. There is pressure on us not to be truth-based. We're told we should keep our, what is called our values to ourselves and not impose them on others, and that's also part of the big squeeze. It's not our values that's the issue. This is not a battle about values, one person's values against another. It's about speaking up for truth. It's about speaking for justice. Years ago, when I was appointed to my first parish, I was an assistant there, I was told by someone, rather disparagingly, that this was the Liberal Party at prayer. <laughs> it's a curious description for a church. One of the things I've always loved and liked about the Australian Christian lobby is that it's steadfastly non-partisan. It doesn't hitch its fortunes to one party or another. It doesn't see its mission as merely to support one side of politics. It's, it's not the Labor. We are not the Labor Party at prayer or the Liberal Party at prayer. And this is important. One of the worst kinds of squeezing is one that takes place in our political consciousness, trying to squeeze us onto the left and right divide. And one of the, I think, lies that have been directed against the Australian Christian lobby has been to locate it on that left-right continuum in one place or another. Now, this idea of the left and the right goes back to the French Revolution. Members of the National Assembly spontaneously divided into two sides. Supporters of the king on the right and the representatives of the church were there. And supporters of the revolution on the left. This language in left, of left and right has colonized everything. It seems no social movement of any kind can escape being labeled on the left or the right, located somewhere on the spectrum, and we get squeezed to be at a particular place. Now, my personality is such that I really dislike labels and stereotypes. I don't like being boxed or labelled, and I've long, long wondered about this left-right framing of the political space. Why should just about any human desire or tendency or inclination under the sun, from racism or anti-racism to care for the environment, why should each of these things be somehow allotted a spot on this single unidimensional spectrum of left and right? It's a puzzling thing. It's a straitjacket. Well, the left has uh, sometimes been called, uh, in the French tradition, for example, the party of movement, and the right, the party of order. And therein lies a key to the, the durability of this distinction, why it's been so important. On the left are those who look to a better and more enlightened future, freed from the shackles of the past, the revolutionaries at the time of the French Revolution. On the right are those who look to the past for stability and guidance, as we enter into a future in which the potential for chaos is ever-present. The left-wing mindset is expressed in a desire to be on the right side of history. This is a hope that future generations are going to be more enlightened than us, we assume that's the case, will pass a favourable judgement on us. Both President Barack Obama and Prime Minister Julia Gillard said that they hoped to be on the right side of history. And by the way, you could tell that former President Obama didn't think well of John Donald Trump when he said, the future does not belong to strong men. <laughs> Some Christians have embraced this mindset. One retired pastor, a friend, a lefty, expressed his hope in relation to same-sex marriage and its debate that future generations will not judge him 
to have been on the wrong side of history. He is hoping that those benighted, clever people in the future will end up thinking well of him because he had supported same-sex marriage. That the future moral sensibilities will be our guide. And this view that some anonymous judges in the future will be so much morally wiser and correct in their judgments than people alive today, it seems to me to be incredibly perverse. Human beings are not evolving morally. The horrors of the 20th century should have taught us that if it taught us anything at all. This idea that people are evolving morally so the future people should be the judge of what's right today, this is not a biblical understanding. It is completely contrary also to the evidence of history. It's not truth-based. And for this reason, this cannot produce a better society. On the other hand, right-wingers tend to look to the past, not the future, for their validation. The label progressive is worn with pride by many on the left. Progressivism affirms belief in progress, the idea that the future will be better. A progressive considers advance to be normal and natural. On the other hand, the conservative remembers the train wrecks of the past and anticipates the possibility of even greater wrecks to come. Progressivism did take some hits in the past century as political movements which appealed to the idea of progress especially the Nazis and the communists, conducted barbarous slaughter on an industrial scale. And the resulting trauma of World War II led some to give up hope in human progress whatsoever. The resulting sense of meaninglessness and despair was channeled into the philosophy of existentialism. But over time, without God, progressivism has cheerily reasserted itself on the minds of the public, buoyed up by the analogy of rapidly evolving technology and our all too human tendency to forget what we find too unpleasant to remember. A biblical critique of progressivism could object that has a flawed, optimistic view of human nature. It denies the reality of sin. But in fact, the reality of sin means that human moral progress is anything but inevitable. And because of sin, progressive political movements can become deeply corrupted promised utopias keep turning out to be dystopias, and the blood shed to bring them about turns out to be a horrid, wicked lie. We, one can think, for example, of the Holocaust or the gulags. On the other hand, conservatism comes up against the same biblical insight about human nature. Cultures, as collective creations of the human soul, for all their beauties and strengths, are deeply distorted by sin. They can be instruments of evil, as well, of, as well as being sources of stability and order. There are great dangers in hitching one's faith to one particular secular political trend or ideological trend. At its worst, progressive Christianity reduces the gospel to a social welfare program grounded in human activism. Who needs a transcendent God or personal saviour when we've got progress? And perhaps for this reason, the advance of progressive Christianity often seems to go hand in hand with decline in faith. It shouldn't surprise us if progressivism in churches is correlated with decline in faith and membership. But at the same time, the same thing can be said for conservatism in churches. When Christianity aligns itself with conservatism, this can end up being very bad news indeed for faith. A case in point was the alliance between Franco's conservative military dictatorship and the Spanish Catholic Church. For a while, the Catholic Church in Spain enjoyed unprecedented spiritual power under Franco's benevolent rule, at least benevolent to them. The church had control of education, for example. And the cost was, today, that Spain has become one of the most secular countries in Europe. Today, only 3% of Spaniards consider religion to be one of their three most important values, much lower than the European average. Today, the average age of Spanish Catholic priests is 66. Franco's government also promoted the Spanish language and culture at the expense of other languages such as Catalan. And the result is that Barcelona, which is Catalan speaking, is today one of the most secular, de-Christianized cities in Europe. Being squeezed into the world's mold brings spiritual death, whichever mold we're squeezed into. It can't be the way for believers. 
I often ponder, for example, how Christians sold out to the political climate in different times in the past. Under the Nazis, the churches almost universally embraced an awful evil to the extent that it's doubtful that they could still be called Christian anymore in any meaningful sense. Yes, there were dissenters and martyrs, and we remember them and we celebrate them, but they were a small minority. German churches simply accepted it when Hitler nationalized every church youth group in Germany, turning them into Hitler youth brigades, human fodder for the Nazi war machine. The churches by and large accepted and embraced and promulgated the anti-Semitism of the times. They welcomed it. Another example was the captivity of the Orthodox Church under the Soviets, and we can hardly judge them given the suffering that the church has experienced. But what was really shameful was the manipulation of the World Council of Churches by the communist regime during the 60s and 70s, the global, this global association of Christians, which had started out so well, let itself become a Cold War pawn of the Soviets, even while the same Soviet regime was brutally persecuting Christians. The fact is that Jesus' message was and is profoundly radical, overturning accepted frameworks and challenging general assumptions that people make. A Christian conscience can expect to find itself swimming against the tide of both the right and the left. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't get involved in political parties. They should, and the more the better, on both sides of politics. If you're thinking of standing for parliament or getting involved in a party, go for it. I will support you and cheer you on with all my energy. There will be times in the history of nations when the best thing a Christian can do is to vote for what we call the left. And there will be times when the best thing a Christian can do is vote for what we call the right. This will not always be the same. It will change from season to season. We can see that by looking back at history in the last hundred years. The enduring challenge for politically aware, engaged Christians is to find new and fresh ways to speak truth into the world, unashamed. We need to cultivate a biblical sense of time and must resist the temptation to hitch our theology or our speech to the spirit of the age on either side of politics. We must not replace faith in a God who saves human beings uh, from sin and calls us to holiness and judges nations according to its, their righteousness. We must not replace faith in that God with a naive belief in progress or dependence upon deeply flawed social and cultural traditions of the past. We should allow our political vision to be constantly tested, reformed, and renewed by the values of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes these things run very deep. We can see in our society today that there is an increase of hatred. There's an increase of abuse. There is an increasing disability in the area of just speaking civilly to one another. And I think one reason for that is that the values of Jesus Christ are not as influential in our culture as they were. When Jesus said, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you, he was laying out a blueprint for engaging with people with whom we profoundly disagree. But even though we might be vehemently and absolutely deeply opposed to someone else's beliefs, we can still engage with them in a civil discourse because we are committed to love people and to treat them with honor and respect. But if you abandon that then any kind of opposition becomes a form of hatred and we spiral into these bitter, hateful recriminations and abuse that has been taking over our public culture. That single value of Jesus, love your enemies yourself, is so profound, that's the way, that needs to transform and continually renew the way we as Christians speak. I said that the difference between left and right has to do with a different understanding of time and how we place ourselves in the midst of time. The vision of history offered in the book of Revelation reminds us that evil and trauma will not go away before Christ returns. There is no utopia on this earth awaiting us uh, before Christ returns. And there is also no kind of glorious past that we can look back to either. Our compass, our longing, our heart's desire needs to be for the kingdom of God and we live in a flawed world, but our job is to speak out for truth and for justice in this world. 
Those words for Jeremiah when the prophet was asked to find even a single person who would speak for truth reminds us that we are held accountable by God, the Lord who judges the nations for speaking up, for speaking up for the dispossessed, for the unborn, for the poor of, of the world, not just the poor of the Australians, of citizens, but everyone around the world that suffers injustice and suffers from disadvantage. We also are reminded by the book of Revelation that as we sit in the midst of time and we work out how to engage with the political environment, that we're engaging in a spiritual battle, that there is a battle going on for nations that is at a high level, and that we need to speak because of this, even so because of this, with great boldness and courage. It's not a time to be quiet, to be retiring, to hope that people will like us, because that's not the way it works in, in, the, in the world that the book of Revelation describes. We need to maintain a central commitment to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I urge us to be involved politically in every possible way. The political project is vitally important. It's worth devoting energy, time and money and commitment to it. But the political project cannot replace the kingdom of God. We seek first the kingdom, but it's because of this deeper longing that we come to a commitment to truth in the public square, to seek justice, to unashamedly seek the well-being of the city in which we live. I've had the privilege in the last six or so years of working with Iranian converts to Christ. Many young Iranians are very, very disillusioned with Islam because they've had decades of the Iranian revolution and it's broken the nation. They have extraordinary high levels of sexually transmitted diseases, of drug addiction, of despair. One young Iranian man who had become a Christian He'd been very broken in Iran. His arms were um, deeply scarred from self-harm. He'd been a drug addict. And I asked him one day, I said, my friend, why did you turn to Christ? And he said, it was a verse of the Bible that touched my heart. I read a verse of Jesus speaking, and I decided to follow him. And I thought, great, I want to know that verse. And I can just kind of wheel it out, and thousands will be converted. I just want the, the killer verse, you know. <laughs> I said, my friend, what is this verse? And he said, it's when Jesus said that when a man looks at a woman with adultery in his heart, he's as good as committed adultery against her. <laughs> he said, I've never heard anyone say anything like that. And as soon as I heard it, he was in detention in Christmas Island reading a Bible. Many of the people came off the boats and the first thing they wanted was the Bible. And he was reading this verse. He said, I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow that person. You know, that insight, it just changes everything. It changes how you see men and women. It changes how you see family structures. It changes how you see community is formed. He understood that because he'd known what it was like to live in a nation that knew nothing of the truth of, of Jesus, that knew nothing of the Sermon on the Mount or the values of the kingdom of God. And when he saw it, it was like that pearl of great price. He was willing to give everything to belong to Jesus, to be transformed by the words of Jesus Christ. We need to believe in the truth that Jesus has shared with us. Our hearts need to committed, be committed to biblical truth and to reflect that boldly into the world in which we live. We need to be fearless, unashamed, grounded in the values of the kingdom of Jesus Christ as we engage speaking the truth without any embarrassment or any looking over our shoulder or worrying about what other people will think, knowing that we will be held accountable by the living God who judges the nations for being a bold witness to the truth in this age in which we live. Thank you. Thank you.